It's my pleasure uh, to introduce to all of you uh, Dr. Gary Gibbons. Dr. Gary Gibbons is the director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the National Institute of Health, where he oversees the third largest institute at the NIH with an annual budget of more than $3 billion and a staff of 917 federal employees. The NH LBI provides global leadership for research, training, and education programs to promote the prevention and treatment of heart, lung, and blood diseases and enhance the health of all individuals so that they can live longer and more fulfilling lives. Before joining the NHLBI, Dr. Gary Gibbons served as the founding director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute, chairperson of the Department of Physiology, and professor of physiology and medicine at the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. And under his leadership of the Cardiovascular Research Institute, Dr. Gary Gibbons directed NIH-funded research in the fields of vascular biology, genomic medicine, and the pathogenesis of vascular disease. It's my pleasure to introduce to all of you Dr. Gary Gibbons. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. It's a real pleasure uh, uh, to uh, join you uh, in the National Quality uh, Minority Forum and this summit. Um, I owe a lot to this organization. I was honored uh, with the Cajal Award uh, uh, a couple of years ago and really appreciate the fine work that this group has done over the years. I'll try to just briefly share with you um, uh, some of our uh, interests uh, in this same space and our commitment to, to working with you uh, as we address the problem of health inequities. Uh, it sort of begins with uh, a little bit of my own personal history, as uh, was alluded to. Uh, I came to uh, uh, the NIH from the Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, in which uh, this has been a, a privilege of, of public service. Uh, it's been a little challenging uh, in these budgetary times to take on this position. Uh, some say my timing couldn't be worse. Uh, but in many ways, uh, th this is really the most compelling time uh, to uh, be challenged in leadership uh, because uh, I know this group is committed uh, to communities that we serve, and this is probably the most important time uh, for us to be engaged in leadership. Uh, it derives from my own interests as a physician, a scientist, an educator, and someone committed to uh, giving back to my community uh, because that's what I indeed believe that is at the heart of the mission of NIH. Uh, the NHLBI's mission is to provide global leadership uh, in research, training, and education that really is designed to, to prevent uh, and treat heart, lung, and blood disorders. And uh, I believe that's true of all communities. And therefore, I think our mission aligns uh, really with the purpose uh, of this meeting. I'm reminded of this quote. Uh, it's a Native American uh, proverb uh, that keeps me grounded about my role as a public servant because I believe that science uh, and the scientific workforce are public goods and that uh, I'm accountable for being a good steward of, of the public's resources and the public goods. Uh, and this quote says, uh, we do not inherit the land from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Uh, and that's really what uh, our task is, uh, not only as leaders of a public agency, but I believe as uh, leaders as you all are uh, in your various communities. Uh, that this is what it's about. Uh, it's what we're, the legacy we're leaving for our children, and it's critical that we make the right choices and decisions and resolve uh, now. In that regard, there are a number of agenda items that I see as we look forward to uh, forging the future of the NHLBI over the next 10 years uh, that are uh, illustrated here, uh, but uh, clearly pivotal to that uh, is our uh, reliance on the essence of what NIH does, uh, which is advancing fundamental discovery science. Uh, but on top of that, I think we are uh, at the stage of unprecedented opportunities to do something bold, uh, which is actually to preempt chronic disease. I believe that the confluence of what we're, we've learned and new knowledge is going to enable us to start to do that in the next 10 years. Similarly, uh, a key priority area uh, that I've outlined that I think resonates with this group uh, is the elimination of health inequities. Uh, and I also believe that it's critical uh, that as we move forward, uh, that science will increasingly involve uh, the creation uh, of, of a more diverse, global, networked scientific community uh, that's engaged with partners and communities 
uh, to change and translate discovery science into human health that affects uh, all communities. Uh, in that regard, uh, I believe critical to that is that we ensure that as stewards, uh, we develop a diverse uh, uh, biomedical workforce, critical to providing the scientific leadership in implementing uh, this vision. Uh, similarly, uh, I think it will, it will involve the creation of what I call a multi-level um, big data scientific commons, where uh, our understanding of each community, its needs, its progress toward health, is something that becomes part of a scientific commons, a shared knowledge that we all contribute to and that we all benefit from. This is part of our uh, vision for the future. Uh, and indeed, uh, this, this data uh, can then be turned into actionable knowledge that uh, we will implement as, as knowledge networks uh, spanning the entire globe, particularly uh, in interest to uh, communities uh, affected by health disparities, both domestically and those in low and middle in, uh, income countries around the world. Now, to fulfill a vision like this, it's critical that we work together uh, as a circle of partners. Uh, that the NIH, and certainly not the NHLBI, can do this alone. Uh, it is critical that we have all the players uh, engaged in this process, uh, and that uh, look, uh, involves uh, researchers, uh, community-based organizations, uh, colleagues in the uh, federal agencies, uh, scientists, practitioners. Uh, basically, it would take all of us uh, working together uh, to create this, this new opportunity. In um, seizing uh, the uh, position and over the last eight months uh, and getting settled in, uh, these are some of the enduring principles uh, that have uh, served the NHLBI very well over the last 65 years that I look forward to continuing over the next uh, 10. Uh, and uh, those involve certain fundamental things that are part of the NIH mission and its character. Uh, and one is to value uh, investigator-initiated fundamental discovery science. Uh, similarly, it'll be critical to maintain uh, a balanced portfolio uh, that uh, promotes cross-disciplinary research that spans from basic, translational, clinical, population, and community-based investigation and, and uh, research. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been blessed that I've had the opportunity as a scientist, to, sort of as a jack of all trades and master of none, uh, to be engaged in a number of those spheres, and it's given me an appreciation for the complementarity of each of those elements to solving complex problems. Uh, critical to that uh, will be the support of implementation science that empowers our partners and patients uh, to be participatory in, again, turning discovery science into human health. This is something that, again, NIH can't do alone, but we should be able to be enabling and catalytic of partners like you uh, to make sure that we actually bend the needle or some of these indicators that you'll be hearing about uh, for the next two days. Uh, critical to that is the next generation. Uh, there are those of us who've got too many gray hairs now, uh, and it's time to, to prepare to pass the baton, uh, and it's critical that we grow up uh, a next generation of scientific leaders uh, trained and capable uh, of, uh, uh, again, continuing to move that needle. Uh, and it's critical that we uh, draw upon the all the talent, and I mean all the talent, of this very diverse and great nation of ours. Uh, and finally, uh, it's critical, uh, and this is a, a principle that uh, we've uh, uh, emphasized uh, since uh, literally my day one uh, on the job, and so it's not a point that it just put in for this summit, uh, but I think it's critical to the mission of the NHLBI as its director uh, that we value the health of all communities uh, and elucidate and eliminate uh, health inequities uh, both in the U.S. and around the world. Now, uh, in terms of our stewardship, uh, I mentioned that a critical part was our biomedical workforce. And uh, this pie chart, and we'll bore you with the details, uh, but uh, you can see on the left the U.S. population. Uh, unfortunately, the pie chart on the right uh, shows uh, the NIH uh, grantee portfolio. And you might have noticed those uh, big pies uh, that are related to particularly uh, uh, racial ethnic uh, groups in this country uh, tend to turn out to be sort of slivers and almost crumbs uh, relative to those who receive uh, NIH funding as investigators. Uh, and this is something that the NIH is going to have to deal with uh, and uh, uh, indeed increase the diversity uh, of our biomedical workforce 
uh, that uh, aligns with the diversity of this nation. Again, recognizing that uh, I believe that the greatness of this country uh, is its leveraging of its diversity. It's done that over the centuries. Uh, it's done it since its inception. It clearly needs to do that in the 21st century uh, as part of a global economy. Now, as a minority scientist, and I'm speaking, uh, uh, preaching to the choir here, uh, we recognize that we have some challenges uh, in uh, uh, having underrepresentation uh, in science. And it's been my experience, and I'm sure it's been many of yours, uh, that there are some critical factors uh, to, to creating a minority scientist. Uh, I believe that critical to any success is, is a sense of passion, uh, commitment, fire in the belly necessary to, to overcome those obstacles and bumps in the road. Uh, and clearly that's a critical individual factor. Uh, but I also believe that uh, it takes faith uh, to become a minority scientist. I can only speak from personal experience, uh, but um, I think it is self-evident that if you ask someone to take on a journey in which no one in their immediate environment has ever been on before, uh, and indeed a lot of folks in their environment are telling them uh, that it's actually impossible, a fantasy, um, it takes faith uh, to believe that you can do something that no one else has done that you know. Uh, and in that regard, I think uh, we have to recognize that uh, we have to be those who uh, serve as, as testimony uh, to those individuals that this is an achievable aspiration. Similarly, I think if uh, a young individual has passion and faith, uh, it's incumbent upon us as leaders, as those who've come before, to be sure they have the opportunities necessary to realize their ambitious dreams. In that regard, I, I borrow from the African proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. I believe it takes a village to raise minority scientists. And that indeed, in this room is a village. Uh, and it's critical uh, that we function as such, as a, really a village of mentors, guides, and role models, uh, as those who can inspire that generation. I will take as our responsibility at NIH that we need to be sure to, to, that uh, we enable of these young people with the resources they need to excel. And I just want to put in a plug uh, for a couple of initiatives that uh, are being launched now that are flowed from uh, advisory uh, council working group uh, uh, established by Francis Collins uh, in which uh, there are two new initiatives coming out of the NIH Common Fund, uh, the BUILD initi initiative and the NR NMRN uh, in which uh, BUILD standing for Building Infrastructure uh, leading to diversity. These are, uh, it's a package of, of, of grants of about $50 million a year, substantial uh, investment, uh, uh, anticipated to be over the next 10 years. Uh, so $500 million devoted to promoting uh, diversity as one element of a larger uh, investment in NIH is doing uh, in this regard. Uh, in particular in this one, uh, focusing in on innovation uh, and innovative ways to expand diversity uh, using uh, elements such as uh, uh, scholarships and, and loan repayment mechanisms, but more importantly, uh, encouraging the community to come up with innovative ways to enhance uh, the, the pipeline that we have. Similarly, uh, another initiative is to develop a national network uh, of mentors that, again, can be part of this village uh, to uh, encourage these young investigators. Uh, again, uh, this is part of our vision for the future in which we want to enlist your support as leaders uh, and as partners uh, in this. Because again, this is not something that NIH can do alone in order to create this diverse, talented, next generation uh, of investigators. Uh, with that, uh, let me pivot from our stewardship of the myobenical workforce to our stewardship of biomedical science as an enterprise. And uh, I know that uh, this uh, audience uh, is about results, research that leads to results, outcomes that affect people in communities. And uh, I'm, I'm blessed that uh, to be director of an institute that's been around 65 years, and because of its efforts and uh, concert with other uh, initiatives, has invested in uh, biomedical research that has indeed bent the curve, uh, that ha is indeed had an impact on public health with over 70% reduction in cardiovascular deaths over the last 50 years, 
related to investments uh, in public health uh, and po population science, clinical trials, basic research, uh, et cetera. That's what has bent this curve uh, and reduced cardiovascular morbidity mortality. Now, I would be the first one to point out uh, that uh, there's been some heterogeneity in the bending of that curve. Not all communities have participated, and indeed, uh, we do have some unfinished business. Um, I, I showed, oops, this is really touchy. Uh, I, I, I showed this um, slide uh, in part uh, because it's historical. Uh, the left panel actually was a slide. Uh, this is a mature group. Well, usually when I'm speaking to, to young people, I have to point out that we used to show, have talks where you know, we'd show things through a piece of film and shine a light through it uh, before PowerPoint. So this was actually a, a real slide at one point that showed uh, all the way back to 1950 the disparities in stroke and how the good news is that overall the curves go down. Uh, the challenge is that there's been a residual gap. And I know you'll see too many of these slides over the next day or two. Um, similarly, uh, on the right side is the, uh, the incident uh, kidney uh, failure, uh, particularly uh, suffered among African Americans and other uh, racial uh, ethnic groups. Uh, I don't need to tell this group about the unfinished business we have in health inequities. Uh, what I would like to share is just a, a couple of thoughts in closing about uh, where we may have some opportunities uh, to, to, to collaborate and work together. Uh, I believe that we're on a threshold that's very exciting uh, in which uh, as we shape our collective future uh, in the 21st century uh, that we have some tools that we've never had before to have an impact on bending this curve. Uh, there being advances in our understanding of systems biology and medicine, the, really the complexity and multi-level nature of biology and biological systems that influence both health and disease. Similarly, we're, we're gaining greater understanding uh, about uh, the ability of the body to repair itself uh, and uh, leveraging that regenerative capacity uh, in a clinical uh, medicinal uh, uh, way and strategies uh, that are unprecedented. Uh, similarly, I think we're, we're in an age in which we're developing and discovering uh, novel biomarkers and genetic markers that will enable us to predict more with greater precision uh, who's at risk in a population, who's at risk uh, within uh, the clinic, uh, and then target and tailor uh, their therapeutic strategies accordingly. Uh, so advances in predictive health that may set the stage for us to actually preempt chronic diseases in, a, in an unprecedented fashion. This is part of the vision I think we're on the threshold of. Uh, and, in the, and it is that vision that I believe can be translated uh, into helping to reduce health inequities, both in this country and around the world. Uh, again, leveraging new technologies and um, genomics, metabolomics, et cetera, imaging, uh, informatics, uh, and uh, stem cell research. Uh, interestingly enough, I think it's also critical that we're, we're gaining insights into what we're calling system science. We're appreciating the ecosystem that surrounds uh, each of us and determines our health uh, in the certainly in the built environment, as well in the other sort of systems, social systems that we're engaged in, such that health inequities can be addressed at the level of systems uh, that are not only biological, uh, but social as well. Uh, in that regard, this is a complicated slide, but it's almost uh, intentionally so, uh, because uh, uh, as we try to address what's at the bottom, uh, to reduce health inequities and stroke and heart failure and kidney failure, one of the things we're appreciating, again, is the complex, multi-level problem, uh, but nevertheless soluble if we appreciate the networks and systems engaged in it. Uh, we're making advances in understanding the biological aspects, uh, the, the effects of the uh, genetics, immune system, uh, and uh, uh, other processes. But on the flip side, what I'm calling the biosocial interface, we're appreciating that dynamic that goes back and forth. Uh, between nature and nurture, between the environmental context and our, our biological uh, substrate that addresses and, and deals with issues of racism, segregation, their effects on lifestyle choices and behavior. Uh, that is also a sphere of discovery science that we also have an opportunity to leverage as we address uh, health disparities. And it's that interaction across that biosocial interface that I think has the greatest promise for addressing uh, health inequities. Uh, it, it comes from this construct of recognizing things at a multi-scale, multi-level uh, sort of way.
but in an interconnected system. This is how we're appreciating our biology works. I believe this is the, the uh, critical to our understanding of determinants of health that fits very well, I think, uh, almost seamlessly with uh, standard social ecological frameworks that many of you uh, are experts in. And appreciating, again, uh, that uh, to really address a complex system problem like health inequities, we indeed need a research agenda and an action agenda and an implementation agenda that addresses all those levels. In that regard, it's going to run a little bit counter uh, to some of our classical NIH-funded reductionist single uh, point of, of, of uh, problem solving uh, to, toward a, a model that's more holistic and multidimensional. Uh, but that's, again, where I believe science in the 21st century is going to be. Uh, so this is part of uh, a transformational change in the way we think about these problems. Uh, this transformation is already going on in our everyday lives. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I, I don't know how many of you are Amazon.com customers, I am, uh, and uh, this is actually a screenshot of my uh, uh, Amazon page. Uh, hopefully I didn't reveal too much here. Uh, <laughs> but I'm always amazed by, by how they know what I really probably want to buy. Uh, and that's because all our data is being collected all the time, every click to whatever we'd like to see and um, everything we've ever bought. And, and, probably Google and everybody else, and maybe even the FBI has more information about us and what we do on electronically than we'd ever want to know. Uh, but part of uh, what Amazon has done is taken this uh, data uh, and worked it through such that they could actually try to predict what book I want to buy next. As it turns out, I tend to like biographies, and so this was back at Christmas. Uh, it, it put up the, the Jefferson uh, biography that had come out. And uh, as it turns out, I was a sucker and I bought it. Uh, but it made me think about um, the ability to predict. And some of you may uh, follow uh, Nate Silver in 538 here in Washington, uh, uh, where everybody's a political junkie, uh, where he'll model everything from uh, the presidential election to, to how the vote will go on gun control. Uh, and so uh, we have that capability uh, in medicine and public health system science. And we're behind the curve. Uh, and I believe this is, an, again, an opportunity to leverage data into actionable knowledge that uh, can address uh, health inequities. And this, these are tools that we haven't had before uh, that, uh, again, we can leverage in a way that uh, uh, even Amazon um, uh, uh, is able to do. Uh, and so I think there's a great opportunity to start to use uh, and transition uh, to the, in the prism of, of health inequities uh, to this sort of systems approach uh, recognizing the multi-level and networked nature of what we do and how we can affect change uh, in this space. And in that regard, um, just one example, uh, I believe relates to our opportunities uh, in genomic uh, medicine that I think is relevant uh, to uh, people of uh, various racial and ethnic uh, ancestries. And this is the work of Carlos Bustamante that uh, uh, is recognized the fact that uh, uh, all human beings are Africans. Um, of course, this group already knows that uh, because the, the, the origin, origin of Homo sapiens uh, is likely to be in Africa, and uh, those original uh, uh, humans uh, migrated to Europe and Asia and populated the rest of the world. But the, the, the root of the human family tree uh, is in Africa, and that's created a great deal of diversity. Uh, and indeed, that is the diversity that has informed our genome. And literally on the right-hand panel, uh, your genome, if sequenced, uh, would give basically a footprint pathway back to your whole family history and inheritance and population history uh, that can be discerned by uh, this uh, uh, really uh, 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 genealogy uh, that can be uh, uh, discerned just from sequencing your genome. Uh, and it reflects that in African American, our own population history, uh, which involved uh, the Middle Passage and slavery, such that African-Americans typically not only had that African root uh, sealed in their, their genome, but you can see the traces of that mixture and interactions with Europeans in this country that's part of our genome. And that's what makes uh, us particularly uh, unique in the world, and indeed, I believe, contributes to some elements of our health and disease patterns. Uh, this, uh, I think, can be illustrated in part uh, by the recent uh, uh, studies in the space of, of kidney disease and, 
and uh, chronic kidney failure. Uh, as uh, Gary mentioned earlier, uh, part of the, the drivers in this, in this city uh, and in our country relates to the expenditures in Medicaid and Medicare that affects the communities that uh, you all uh, represent and work in. And one of the key drivers of that uh, is in fact chronic disease. And that's part of our portfolio at NHLBI, um, driving uh, these uh, uh, health care expenditures. Now, I'm not a policymaker, and in fact, I'll get in trouble uh, if I start uh, trying to tell my appropriators what to do. So I have to be careful here. Uh, but I would submit to you that one of the ways that we may be able to reduce Medicare expenditures uh, is not so no much about cutting benefits, but I believe that there's an opportunity in innovation uh, in which our, I believe scientific discovery and the continued advances that we've made in bending the curve, uh, preventing and indeed preempting uh, these chronic disorders could be our best strategy to reduce those costs in the next 10 years. And we have opportunities right now to seize and take advantage of that. And paradoxically, one of our best examples may relate to preventing uh, chronic kidney disease in African Americans because the seeds are actually sowed uh, probably when we were uh, in Africa and our ancestors were there. Uh, because we were interacting uh, with an environment in sub-Saharan Africa that involved a lot of uh, 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 the social context in that situation where the parasites and, and other infectious disorders uh, that has really shaped our genome uh, as our body's defense systems were engineered uh, and encoded in our genome to protect us from those threats uh, during that period of time. Those imprints are still in our genome and they've affected our whole uh, body's defense system. Very adaptive to the context of sub-Saharan Africa, but actually maladaptive to the context of 21st century United States of America. And uh, one example of this uh, is a uh, study, a very provocative one, uh, uh, published uh, uh, now in 2010 uh, by Genovese and Kopp and uh, uh, Bowden and a number of colleagues uh, who were looking at the genetic determinants of end-stage renal disease and identified uh, ApoL1 uh, uh, variants as predisposing factors in the development of chronic di disease, actually a five-fold higher risk if you had that variant. And this variant is actually fairly common amongst African Americans, uh, about uh, five to 10 percent general prevalence. Uh, and uh, you might think that odd that something like this uh, was, has such a high prevalence and uh, may be a disease risk factor, but indeed it actually was protective uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. This variant uh, actually is, is, is uh, trypanolytic. It kills a trypanosome that uh, causes sleeping sickness in sub-Saharan Africa. So that variant that was protective became more and more common because it provided a survival advantage in sub-Saharan uh, Africa and is now part of our genome now in this new context. But we don't have to worry about sleeping sickness, but that same process, unfortunately now, predisposes to end-stage renal disease in the context of having hypertension. So what was protective back in the day is now contributing to health inequities and disparities in chronic kidney disease. Well, with that information, we have an unprecedented opportunity. We now know a predictive factor uh, that can tell us, beyond measuring the blood pressure, who's most likely to develop and, and end up in a dialysis ward. Uh, and I don't need to tell this audience any dialysis ward you go to, uh, there are too many of us uh, uh, sitting there. Uh, if we had that knowledge, that foreknowledge, how could that help us in risk prediction? How could it help us design better therapeutic strategies and, and indeed perhaps even better drugs to interrupt and preempt that disease? So in closing, I think there's some unprecedented opportunities that we sit, sit on the threshold of. Uh, and I believe it's part of uh, leveraging uh, this, this emergence of big data and uh, networking health systems that I believe can catalyze system science in minority health. Uh, we are in a networked world uh, in which uh, uh, we uh, are transitioning from those old paper medical records uh, to electronic medical records. Uh, I had to put down my phone uh, so as not to uh, um, interfere uh, with this, but uh, all of us are, are addicted to our smartphones that are connected and can do all kinds of things. It can see how physically active I am, measure my heart rate, uh, uh, see images, 
Uh, I, could, I could get messages about what I should be doing next. I can uh, uh, transmit what I ate uh, this morning. Uh, there are tremendous opportunities that exist that were unprecedented in a way that, uh, again, could be part of transformative change in our system. And it begins with uh, leveraging that big data in our networks. What I hope, though, is that we don't give in to a technology divide. Uh, if there's any group of communities that need to get networked, it's the communities that you represent. Um, if there are any health systems that need to work as a network, it's the, 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 the health systems that deliver care in minority communities, whether it's fairly qualified health centers or HMOs or academic centers. Um, the NHLBI has, has been committed and will be committed to classical population science cohorts uh, that uh, are representative of Hispanics, African Americans, uh, and Native Americans. But it's also important for this group to think about the other networks that need to be developed, the networks of, of clinical trialists uh, that need to uh, ask and answer questions relevant to uh, the, the patients that you serve. Uh, we need uh, uh, networks uh, that um, can link data that uh, makes robust uh, the number of, of uh, people of color uh, that are in our clinical repositories. The NHLBI has funded uh, a network of cardiovascular um, uh, uh, science that involves a number of the HMOs across this country, Group Health, uh, Geisinger, um, Kaiser. Uh, but as you might imagine, uh, some of those being in the Northwestern uh, uh, United States, uh, uh, people of color are underrepresented in those networks. It covers, however, 10 million uh, patient lives. And so it's an incredibly powerful scientific uh, platform. We need to be in that platform. We need you to be engaged in creating a platform that's reflective of the diversity of this country. Uh, and again, uh, that sharing of data is critical to asking and answering questions related to health disparities. Uh, this data is not limited to physicians and scientists. Uh, I believe we have, again, a great democratization of, of data generation. It's not just up to scientists anymore. As I mentioned, anybody with a mobile phone can now be a knowledge generator and a knowledge contributor, and a data contributor, and again, a receiver of the benefits of our knowledge. We have to leverage that democratizing uh, sort of technology that is involved in all of our communities. Because uh, that's, again, what I think will create is a scientific commons that, again, reflects the diversity of the greatness of this nation. It will also be a hotbed for training the next generation, because uh, this will be a great resource of both knowledge generation and action uh, that uh, will serve them well. So to conclude, uh, I'll leave you with another uh, crazy thought uh, as we envision the future, uh, and that is uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take uh, Gary uh, up a notch uh, because uh, they've done a marvelous job at creating these atlases. And uh, I believe we, we need to build on that with multiple dimensions of that atlas uh, of minority health system science uh, in which we bring together a lot of these tools that are part of 21st century science uh, that can define the biology in extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary ways that are unprecedented and marry that uh, to those things that are reflective of the particular context of minority communities that tell us also geospatial information about whether they live in a, a food desert or not and also conveys what they personally are experiencing uh, perhaps in their mobile uh, phone and devices. Uh, these are unprecedented opportunities uh, of, of, uh, which I see laying out before us in which we will be fulfilling our mission of preventing and preempting chronic disease uh, in partnership uh, with organizations like you and those you represent, uh, in which we have unprecedented opportunities uh, to turn discovery science into human health as part of our mission by engaging in high impact leading edge discovery and implementation science uh, that again leverages strategic partners to actually be on the ground and make a difference, bending that curve in ways that reduce uh, health disparities. Uh, so I'm excited about the opportunity. I, I don't get caught up in the doom and gloom of what happens on Capitol Hill because um, you know, I'm just uh, a guy who uh, grew up in the streets of Philadelphia and uh, to me uh, running an agency that uh, despite our cut, 
still has $2.9 billion, uh, I think we can still do some stuff uh, with $2.9 billion uh, that addresses the critical problems that relates uh, to the communities you prevent, uh, represent. Uh, NIH has done this before. It's had a very proud tra uh, tradition. As shown here is uh, FDR dedicating actually uh, building one uh, on campus. Uh, and uh, one of the key early wins uh, was the research uh, that eliminated uh, polio from our consciousness. Um, but uh, we also recognize that our, we have unfinished business, that we can do discovery science, translate it into a major public health advance. But if it just stays in this country, uh, then we have still unfinished business. Uh, there's still uh, children in Africa uh, that still suffer the ravages of polio. Uh, and until every last child uh, has access to that, uh, we have unfinished business. But again, uh, all of this was within our capability. Uh, and I'll leave you with this uh, final challenge, uh, both for you and for us, that I laid out to uh, uh, the American Society of, of Hematology uh, when I first spoke to them in the fall, uh, just a few, in, few months into the job, um, uh, I was, uh, as we used to say, bodacious enough uh, as a cardiologist to go into a hematology meeting, start telling them about sickle cell disease. Uh, but uh, indeed, I, I believe that um, the NHOBI has funded a lot of great advances. Uh, it's actually shown on this slide where uh, the treatment of, um, uh, with transfusions and hydroxyurea that was pioneered by NIH-funded research and clinical trials uh, is having a major impact. Uh, but uh, uh, when I was in Atlanta, I was exposed to one of the, the largest sickle cell disease uh, clinics uh, in the country. And uh, I still saw the devastating effects uh, of stroke uh, in six-year-old children. Now, as a nation, we wept appropriately so for the horrific uh, murders of six-year-olds a few months ago in which uh, there's incredible hue and cry and incredible legislation efforts. Uh, but there's six-year-olds in this city right now, probably one this week, who's had a stroke related to sickle cell disease. I think it is within our grasp to think about a stroke-free generation of children with sickle cell disease. This is doable. We have the resources. Uh, I'm confident that we can do the discovery science. I'm also confident with the folks in this room, we can do the implementation science to make that impact and bend that curve such that we're not just happy because we're down to 20% who have strokes. So I'll end with this quote. Uh, a lot of people are waiting for Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi to come back, but they're gone. We're it. It's up to us. It's up to you. Thank you.